Hello and welcome to WTF's Spring Weekly Town Hall series. I am Johanna Maynard Edwards. I use she, her pronouns. I am streaming to you from the ancestral land of the Tuscarora Nation of NC, colonially known as Raleigh, North Carolina, although there are many, many, many tribes that have once and always or still call this area home. Um, I just happen to be in a specific corner from the Tuscarora Nation. Um, a vi brief visual description of me is that I am a 40 something year old white woman with a side braid of dark hair and pinkish bangs and a bright green ponytail holder. Um, I'm wearing a, a marled gray hoodie with a pink wall behind me and a window. And that is me tonight. And I'm here with you for a town hall themed. What's the state of theater in Raleigh where we live? And I have some two awesome, awesome panelists here to kick off the evening with us. We're gonna talk together about um, their experiences in theater here in Raleigh. And then we're gonna open it up to our in Zoom audience of town hall participants to join the discussion. And those of you who are out there in FB land, um, you can always register to join the Zoom through Eventbrite and get on into this event. It's free of charge. Or you can comment and follow along out there in FB land. And we're happy you're here. Welcome. And welcome panelists. Hello, Abby and Danny. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Sure, I'll start. Um, my name is Abby Fralix. I am currently the development director at Burning Coal Theater, um, but I have been around the Raleigh theater scene off and on um, since about 2013, I think is when I, I've been working professionally as an actor um, in Raleigh since 2013, so a few years. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited to be here tonight and discuss all things theater in Raleigh. Amazing. Thank you so much. Danny, over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Danny Cohen. I am a local actor, performer, writer, um, uh, yeah, playwright, I guess I can call myself that now, um, in, um, in the Raleigh area. Um, I uh, actually started doing theater um, at NC State University. I'd never been in a play before. Um, and I just picked up acting and I fell in love with it. Um, so I've been acting since 2018. Um, so this will be my sixth year and um, started writing plays in 2022. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and, and talk about theater. Danny, I cannot believe that you didn't start acting until 2018. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually did um, poetry recitation competitions, um, which gave me a really strong like understanding of language and a love for, for history and literature and writing. Um, but I didn't start acting. I, yeah, I had never, I had never acted until, um, until I was cast in my first play in the blood at NC State. Um, and here we are today. <laughs> Your uh, your Emily Webb in our town is the most memorable Emily I've ever experienced. Oh my and gosh! It hold, held you in the highest regard since then. This is someone who is going to take our community by storm. Oh, thank you. I love our town, and I actually have a um, a little reference to it in my in my own play. Um, a little like a little a little you know for those who know. <laughs> Um, a little line that I say, I want to live life while I live it every, every minute, which is part of Emily's monologue. Because um, when I did that role, she definitely became like a part of me. Um, and I was so excited to just portray her in a, in a different way as like, somebody wrote in the reviews that she's like, I did like a quirky and nerdy thing. And I was like, excuse me, I am not a nerd. And then they were I was like, yeah, I am. I definitely am. <laughs> But it, I mean, it worked and I, um, and I'm so, I'm so happy she's still a part of me. Um, and yeah, I really couldn't, couldn't say enough good things about the play. Well, speaking of your play and something that is about to happen in the Raleigh theater scene, would you like <laughs> to tell us a little bit more about it? 
Oh, I would love to. Um, so my newest uh, project that's coming out is my play Ex-Boyfriends, um, and it will be a part of Burning Coal's second stage series. <laughs> Uh, it's directed by Amelia Lumpkin and Barbette Hunter. So we've got a dream team going. Um, and I'm so excited about the play because it really focuses on on my own experiences um, and tells the journey of um, of my own journey in, in therapy and um, navigating different relationships um, with men that all of the men double as manifestations of different mental disorders that I've dealt with. So like anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder and um an eating disorder um in a way that's like it's poetic so overcoming these trials is um is at the center of the story of of Maya's story named after Maya Angelou love her and um the main character uses um the power of her poetry the power of her writing to turn these men from her memories into puppets um so it's a way of objectifying these memories to take away their power and um she's learning these like life lessons about herself and making all of these discoveries um through through these memories of her relationships this play sounds incredible <laughs> <laughs> i'm really, really you're co-signing you know <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah so i as danny mentioned it's actually premiering at burning coal in June, so next oh, two months away. <laughs> I don't. I know what time is. It's fine. Um, as part of our second stage series that we do every June, um, as a way to promote new authors and new playwrights, new works. Um, again, the the up and coming. You know what's next for for theater in Raleigh. So really excited to have Danny as part of the series this year. Yeah, wait till you see this series is a great yep. kind of um, segue into this conversation because it it is like one of the mech one of the few mechanisms in our local theater community that we can point to that over time has been that type of a launching place for fresh voices, new voices, experimental voices, new pieces. And, you know, I've been fortunate to be a part of that series a few times. Yeah. And as, as a writer, director, producer, um, co, you know, co this, co that, and, and, it, it holds a very important place. And Danny, it's kind of, it's amazing um, to like, for your work to be kind of like part of this, this piece of, of a local legacy. And also like, it sounds like this play, this play and you are going places. And so we're lucky to have it start here and see where it goes. Um, I feel, I just want to say like how fortunate I am to have so much support and um and encouragement from this community um i know for me like not having having not done this before and coming from a background that's that's different a background of like writing writing poetry translating that and, and being given these opportunities to um to shine and and make my voice known um really empower me and make me so excited about like where theater is going and I'm so grateful to Burning Coal for giving me this opportunity I just like I just can't thank them enough <laughs> yeah yay Burning Coal yay Danny <laughs> yay Abby yay theater and where it's going let's talk more about that um and and like to say uh not every feeling about where theater is and where it's going are good feelings right <laughs> we can like own that and um one of the kind of great things we said it before we went live but we'll say it again for everyone in the world we're just people and we're going to be speaking in draft from our own experiences and and really um want to hold space for anyone listening, participating, or uh, just feeling these vibes from the universe that your experience is valid and true and there's space for it in all of this if it's not reflected from ours. Um, so that being said, uh, gut check. My first question is around what is your impressions of what is happening on the in the theater scene in Raleigh on a holistic level in general. Um, and if it's helpful, you can 
as, as we said, we are speaking in draft. You can do it as an I feel statement. I feel blank <laughs> about theater in Raleigh. I think for me, my like feelings about theater in Raleigh fluctuate um, depending on the day and depending on the hat that I'm wearing. Um, so there are a lot of times where I feel really optimistic about seeing all of the things that all of the theaters are doing. And it always seems like there's a new a new company starting up or a, you know, a new production coming. That's always really exciting to see that there are things happening. Um, and then I, you know, the pendulum swing will happen for me. I am a, I, I may look like I'm, you know, 20 something, but I am not. Um, <laughs> and so when I see, you know, shows opening I'm like, okay, cool. Like where are, are the roles for the women in their thirties that are interesting? Um, I have been very lucky to get to play a lot of different roles. Um, and a lot of different shows, but I also play a lot of men, which is super fun. But I, I am always looking for more, more roles that I can embody that I are actually part of my lived experience. Um, so it's, you know, it varies day to day, really optimistic about really exciting things and wishing that there were more opportunities as well. Um, yeah, so that's that's my gut check where I'm at right now. A pendulum of excited to wishing. <laughs> yeah. oh. Danny, how about you? How are you feeling in general? In general, actually, this was probably the hardest question for me to try and like p- pick an emotion because I was like, I feel so many emotions about the about <laughs> the scene. I was like, oh my goodness, like I can't. So maybe if I had to pick one, it would be like cautiously optimistic. Um, but I agree- like that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> agree with that. It really does depend on which hat I'm wearing. Um, I think that as a as a playwright, it's it's easier to sort of feel that optimism and excitement um, because of what's happening for me right at this moment. Yeah. Um, but as an actor, I also experience like unfortunately a sense of of grief and longing sometimes mm-hmm. um and this and this wishing for um for for strides in terms of diversity and um seeing more complex characters seeing more um more women of color and complex characters and wishing for more stories especially surrounding um black joy instead of black mm-hmm. trauma um, I feel like there are certain sort of aspects and and stories about Black history that get told a lot. Um, I I've seen a lot of productions of Ragtime. I like Ragtime, <laughs> but there are like there are there's so so many complex facets and interesting moments in time and interesting pieces of work and stories about people of color that unfortunately I just haven't seen in this area. Um, and that's one of the things that it, that inspired me to start writing my own stories because I was like, I'm not feeling represented. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't see myself in these stories, and I know I like to act, so I'm gonna write my own story. So as an actor, sort of that sense of longing and and grief are um, are definitely pertinent for me at this moment. Ooh, I, I I held my heart with you there, Danny, and took a took a breath yeah that like the opportunities uh I'm hearing from both of you like things about opportunities you want to have as artists and 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 as audience and like Danny as audience members right as like Mm -hmm. just want to see more more stories different stories stories that do the things that I'm that I'm looking for I I feel that so much like that is um, a huge hunger that I have and part of um, part of why like I think I have a big pattern to, of taking on way more than I can chew because you know if we're doing an event like our Occupy the Stage where we get like 400 submissions and they're amazing it's like ooh, let's let's get 40 of these plays let's get these stories heard let's do this and like that um which leads to my own like gut check response about how I feel about theater is 
like I, I swing from an, a major abundance mindset to a, I'm so tired. I can't imagine doing this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> within it, within a single hour, <laughs> y'all are feeling the abundance and then <laughs> like, Oh, I'm too tired to do it as I stream from bed. Right. <laughs> Um, what else, like, is there anything about what each of you shared that you want to respond to each other? I want to kind of hold space for that before I ask you an even more specific question. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate Danny, what you said about the, like the joy and the grief together. And, you know, there's a way to occupy and hold multiple emotions at the same time. Um, and I think it's kind of just like living in hope that, you know, the things that we are looking for will come to pass and being okay if we have to wait a while for for those to happen. I think for me too, with like hearing like, oh, we have like these similar wants. We all have things that we all like, oh, we don't really want these things. And so I'm like, so the idea, I I don't know if people are, are into, into like tarot, but I'm actually like, I've recently really gotten into it and I've really gotten into the idea of, um, of the emperor, which is the idea of decisive and strategic action. Um, mm. So I think it's important to kind of like apply that with theater, like, okay, we see that we all have this thing in common. We have this thing that we want. What are the steps we can take? Which is so funny, Joanna, because that's literally the next question. But like, <laughs> I'm a fan of sort of like, I love an action plan. I love like, what are the, you know, what are the specific, what's a smart goal? What are the things that we can like really come together? Because we have these ideas, we have these similar foundations, like how can we make things happen? Because we have like, we have more power than we give ourselves credit for. Totally, totally. And like, just talking about like, oh my gosh, we're all thinking about these things. What if we helped, like helped each other more in, in think tanks, in rooms and, Danny, you're speaking my language. Put it in, get the ideas, put them in a smart goal, and then those little boxes that you can check off, and then achieve your dream. It's, <laughs> it's, it's part of it, you know. Shoot for the moon, even if you don't land, you'll be in the stars. <laughs> yes, and and hey, one one plug for how into tarot we are is we're doing an eight week playwriting workshop based around tarot, and we're calling it the Spooky. <laughs> tarot plays workshop <laughs> where each week for eight weeks um the the tarot pull will guide the writing and the shaping of the work and in week seven we're inviting some like pretty well-known names to give feedback to the writers before a public reading so That's yay awesome. yay tarot That's very cool. <laughs> the power to, <laughs> for creativity um <laughs> So yay, a plug for WTF workshops coming up this spring. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna ask you a question that we put out on the on the socials this week, which is if you were granted three wishes for the Raleigh theater scene, what would they be? Ooh. Um oh goodness, I had them. This is why I write things down and I didn't. So for me, the one there are a few things that I've been thinking about holistically and wishing that we had more of. Um, one is collaboration between theater companies and individuals and just a spirit of coming together. You know, theater is story, it is group storytelling. Um, and I, I have seen just in my time in Raleigh and other, other markets as well, it's not, you know, just RDU, but there, there can be a spirit of competition amongst, you know, companies and individuals, um, and it doesn't serve anyone. And I, I want to see that collaborative spirit come together more, and I'm constantly looking for ways to do that. Um, so that's one. So collaboration and then accessibility is another, both in terms of bringing in audiences that don't necessarily know the Raleigh theater scene um, or people that do know the, the scene and aren't able to, to come see performances, whether that's through financial hardship or our theater spaces just physically not being accessible to them. 
um, whether they have you know physical handicaps or or physical you know limitations um, or you know spaces where they're not sure that they'd be welcomed. So I I have just got back from a trip where I was able to see just how a lot of different theaters are approaching accessibility in different very cool ways um, that I'm excited to start hoping to you know talk about and figure out how we can um, implement some of those. And then the third one that I had was, oh, just like, again, kind of tangentially bringing in new audiences. Um, one thing that we at Burning Coal have been discussing in depth is how do we, how do we reach younger audiences? Um, you know, people in their, you know, teens, 20s, 30s, 40s that would come see theater, but not necessarily the theater that we are, have been producing, you know, what, what do those audiences crave? Um, you know, is it interactive? Is it site specific? Is it just word of mouth? Um, you know, plays that speak to the generations that you know have the time and the funds to come see theater now, and what does that look like? So. Collaboration, audiences, access. Yep, those are good things. I love hearing that you have the access bug. We'll get more into that in a moment. But first, <laughs> Danny, over to you. Well, we have um, some similar goals um, in terms of accessibility. That's my third, my third wish. Um, my first wish is um, I don't I don't have like one word, but I have sort of like phrases. Um, but I want theater, um, the theater to to feel more like a, a growth and learning experience mm -hmm. instead of a place for experts. Um, I think that there are, in just in our culture right now is a lot of um, perfectionism and a lot of fear of making mistakes. And we see, unfortunately, a lot of the same faces over and over because these are people who are used to doing theater, know how to do it. And so those are often the people um, that were like, I, you know, I understand too, as somebody who's been on the side of like, of casting, somebody that you know, is, you know, is going to be a safe bet. But creating more experiences for people who don't already know how to do things. I was one of those people. I was a person who didn't know what stage right and stage left was. I still don't. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> just creating like creating more experiences and opportunities for people to learn and to not have that expectation that you already know to to make space for questions um make space for discovery um that's my first wish um my second is something that i touched on earlier um but i would like more diverse stories um which also includes more diverse casting in traditionally white mm -hmm. stories I think sometimes people can get a little concerned with the like semantics of, oh, this show, we I can't cast this person of color in a family with white people, but we're already in theater. Like we can suspend yeah. our disbelief. We're already suspending enough disbelief. Like I really don't think that that's something that we need to be worrying about as much. Um, so yeah, the inclusion of like people of color in stories I know for me, one of the biggest examples of this is literally I have a sticker on my water bottle of um, of the Rogers and Hammerstein Cinderella with brandy in it. Yes, um, I that is yeah, what I love that movie. Act. That's what inspired me to be a performer. <laughs> um, is because this was a traditionally white story, a Broadway musical, cast all white, and they decided to change up the casting and a black woman and a white man have a Filipino son. And we're like, sure. And like, and it's a fantastic story. It's wonderful. Like it is for me, my favorite version of Cinderella that I've ever seen and watching it as a little girl, I had it on VHS. I watched it all the time and seeing someone who looked like me in as a beautiful princess, instead of in, you know, narratives, that are traumatic or couldn't be seen um, that I couldn't see. Like, I know my parents were like, let's watch Roots. Um, and I was like, okay, <laughs> I want to watch Cinderella though. You know, like, so just seeing like more faces of color in these light, bright, beautiful stories. I think we can really change like the standards and ideas. We can change beauty standards. We can change like standards of how we think of like, who's in a community and who, who is important? Whose stories do we tell? Um, I would love to see that. I'd love to see more people of color in the stories we tell. 
Um, and third is the accessibility piece. I know for me as an actor, um, looking out into the audiences and looking around, I'm like, wow, people do not look like me. And when my friends come to performances, um, you know, my friends are loud and they are excited and they're like happy to be there, but they feel kind of out of place. They don't feel as comfortable because they're looking around and they're like, oh my gosh, people do not look like us. And I think one of the reasons for this is, is that it's just in terms of like where it's marketed is like, okay, the audiences we already have and sometimes ticket prices are not super accessible, um, especially to young people. Um, and like the time, time commitment, like these are things I understand. So breaking down those barriers and thinking about how do we invite more people into this space? Um, something that I learned from, from Bernie Cole doing um, shake scenes, which are little Shakespeare workshops for kids is that, um, we think of like people doing Shakespeare who attended Shakespeare plays as very like, oh, proper and and rich and like the queen. And it's like, no, Shakespeare was for everybody. It was for like the, you know, the people in town and you would either watch a bear, bear baiting or watch a play. And I just, I want theater to have that same thing. I want it to be for everyone. I want it to feel fun. I want it to make people think and make people feel and just be a space where everyone feels welcome. Heck yes. Yes, yes, yes. Welcome space. Yes. One of my magic wand things is that like all marketing works. <laughs> it all like, <laughs> like every, every marketing idea and initiative works exactly the way you intend it. And <laughs> all the audience is filled exactly the way you need and want <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so yeah let's pick a wish and since excessive access was on both of the lists let's um like pick at it a little bit pull at the thread a little bit what what do y'all think would make what are like things that would make it more possible would make an audience feel more welcome or more possible being there I think Danny brought up something really interesting about the your friends coming and you know being boisterous and then not feeling if that's a uh, allowed in the theater space and you know, traditionally you, know, you come into a theater space and you're very quiet and you sit and you watch the play um but I've gotten to see a lot of plays throughout the years where like that idea of audience interaction is integral, not just to the show, but as soon as you walk into the theater space, you know, it is, it's an event. You know, how do we, how do we al alert audience members to the fact that they are wanted and they are in that, you know, they are welcome in the space as soon as they walk through the door. Um, and I don't have an answer for that necessarily yet, um, but it is something that I am really interested in experimenting. And I think allowing ourselves the, the space to try and fail um, yeah. and then try again and then fail differently and fail forward. Um, you know, we're, none of us are going to get it right on the first or third or fifth or 10th try necessarily. Yeah. Um, but it's just a constant experimentation and asking our audiences, you know, what, what do they need? What do they want? What would make them feel welcome? Um, I think yeah. is a really important question to start asking. I think it's so, it, the way, like you're talking about all the ways, I think they're implicit and explicit ways mm -hmm of doing and, and saying it and doing it over and over and over again till people believe you yeah. because like we still, we can't control if like our, our spaces, we're doing that. We're saying you're welcome to be exactly how you are and who you are, believe us. But then they go to the next space where that is not reinforced, you know? Yeah. And so it's like how to like build that no, believe me, this is for you. This is for you. We mean it. Um, all the implicit and explicit ways to do that. And I mean, not that we've like solved it at all at WTF, but uh, um, at, during our invited dress rehearsal for Dance Nation, the room was really full of the company members 
friends and family, you know? And so they uh, heard in the curtain speech and read across the um, captioning screen that like, we're saying you're welcome to vocalize and, and be in this space with the fullness of your humanity. And the, for some reason they did believe us and maybe they felt that permission, especially because it was an invited dress and not a paid performance. And they were so vocal, so encouraging, so many whoops, hollers, loud, yes, queens and all the things. And that was the missing character of the show is that type mm, of an actual yeah. presence from the audience. And so from that point forward, we're like, oh, we better put plants in to like make sure people really know to do this, you know, to really, really, really make noise and say your piece. But it's so it's so hard. Yeah, and I think it's something that takes time to build as well. Yeah. Like the, the companies that I know that do it well have been doing it for 10 or 15 years and they've built that audience base that knows that when they come see a show at XYZ Theater, you know, they are they have that permission to be a little raucous, to you know, not just sit there and clap politely when the lights go down, um, but to feel, you know, all of the feelings. Um, but it does, it's something that takes time. And as you said, both implicit and explicit permission. I love that idea of the impl implicit and explicit permission. I know for me as a performer, I feed off of audience's energy. So when an audience is more responsive, as a performer, I'm having so much more fun when they're laughing at my jokes. Like the, just the difference between like, a, a matinee performance to like a Friday or Saturday night performance like it can feel so different and that's one of the the joys of live theater is that every performance is different um but giving giving people that permission I think is so important um I I wrote down a couple other things um just in sort of in store in thinking about like tangible yeah. things um I know for me, something that I have seen happening and that I've implemented in my own works, I um before my my play, I actually had a one woman show mosaic um, at NC State, and I'm really proud of that as a one woman show. And um, we ended up using a uh, a sliding pay scale for for tickets, so you could yeah. kind of decide um, based on how much you could afford, and this made it so much more accessible. Um, because people, some people have a lot to give. So like my parents, friends were like, sure, I'll pay $50 for a ticket because they have that kind of money and they <laughs> want to support the arts, you know, so giving people that option. And then I have friends who are in college and do not have money and are like, here is $5. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm like, perfect. <laughs> thank you for like, thank you for coming. I am happy to have you here and letting people know that they are they are welcome in this space no matter their financial financial place is so important and i think something that i would personally love to see implemented more hard agree and the, i the yeah. data backs it up you know i would love to anyone out there listening who wants to participate in some research on that because danny what you've described is what we've experienced too is that there's always some folks who will pay more than general admission. And mm -hmm. there's always folks who are super grateful to have that $5 ticket or that welcome yeah. option. And, and a good 60% of your audience will pay the general admission. No problem, you know? And so it would be great to start putting, <laughs> aggregating some data. Is that how we say that? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, yeah, I absolutely think that's something that's important because I know for me, just as a, as a student, as a young person, I'm going back to school in a month. Um, I'm so excited. I'm going to get my master's in social work. So the, the counseling thread is all through. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I like, I don't have an income and I still want to see shows. I still want to support my friends. I want to be out in the community because I think every every show you get to go to you learn something new and i want to have those experiences and so creating like ways that are more accessible um and more just i don't know like forgiving and we shouldn't like we shouldn't be punitive and punish people for not having money like 
that's not what theater is about. That's not, yeah. that's not our thing. Right. So great. Um, money. That's a thing that like, has <laughs> <laughs> great, <laughs> fabulous segue. Let's talk about the money of it all, because that is where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? And that is um, for the folks who responded and engaged on this question on social media, it a lot of it came down to a word free, free rehearsal space, free performance space, free, free tickets, right? <laughs> and so money, what do we do? What do we do? This is my entire day job. Um, ask <laughs> is what I have found is you, we have to ask um, and it, you get, you get more money asking than you will get. If you don't ask, you might not get everything, but you'll get more, um, is what I am learning and figuring out ways to, oops, ah, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. You're very you know, getting, getting that community support, you know, at $5 goes just as far as 50 does sometimes. And, you know, we are constantly looking to see how we can do in kind trades with people. And it's like, I can't afford to, you know, pay you, you know, a certain amount of money for, you know, your time and talent, but I can give you my time and my talent. Um, so bartering with other companies, you know, forming those connections, it, it all comes back to collaboration and community. Um, and taking care of each other and recognizing that, yeah, like money is tight and it continues to be. And, you know, we're constantly seeing funds get cut to the arts. Um, space is always an issue and time. You know, there are so many people that are, you know, have amazing projects that they're trying to get up off the ground and there's only so much that each of us can do, but if each of us can do a little bit, the larger community is fed. Yeah. That asking. Yeah. Is, and like, it's, it can be an uncomfortable ask, but the more you do it, the more you get used to it. Um, and, you know, as I think Danny and I can both speak to if as a performer, you get used to hearing no a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like, it's just one more no. But there, yeah, you know, yeah. for everyone that says no, there is someone that will say yes. Yeah, and you got to get comfortable hearing no because the no yeah. makes way for the right yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I totally, ahead, Abby. What you're saying about like you have to ask is t very, very pertinent to me, especially as engaging in um in producing producing my play. Yeah. You know, like starting with. I don't have any money to, um, I know for me, like a big, the biggest source of funding for this project is the United Arts Council. Um, mm -hmm. I'm one of their grant mm -hmm. awardees this year. So thank you so much to them. Um, and looking out for, for grant opportunities, I know that those have been sent to me. They're not always available if you're a student, um, but if you're a working mm -hmm. professional looking into those opportunities, um, and, and yeah, and asking people around you, um, Abby and I actually talked about having a fundraiser, uh, for, um, for ex-boyfriends, but my grandpa heard that I was going to have a fundraiser and he was like, no, I want you to spend your, your time in other ways. So he just wrote me a check for the amount that I wanted to fundraise. And I never would have expected that. I was like, my heart was so warm. I was crying and I was just like, I was so excited, but that, you know, just putting yourself out there is, is so important and is really part of how it happens. Um, and, and like you said, community leveraging your community. Um, I was able to put on a stage reading of ex-boyfriends at NC State. Um, and I'm an alumni and it wasn't, it was a free event. Um, and in exchange for the um, stage reading, I did a, uh, a workshop. My director and stage manager, manager and I exchanged a workshop. So this idea of like, we can exchange other things that aren't money. Mm -hmm. Like there are, we have other resources, we have creativity. What are the ways that we can kind of think of, um, of getting around things or thinking creatively about this? Because 
we have so much imagination. Like as artists, that's our, that's our biggest like yeah. resource. So figuring out how we can use that and leverage that, even if we don't have as much financial means, um, is something that's important. And I, I don't mean to like not acknowledge people. Like I understand not having financial means and the absolute burden and trauma and energy mm -hmm. suck that that brings. I think it's really important to acknowledge that and do what we can to to help people who do have that that burden um, to to bring them up so that they don't have to deal with as much stress and think about how can we make those people's lives easier. Yeah. 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 Bring them up. Yeah. Well, before we bring some other people up, as in bringing all of our attendees in as your uh, co-panelists to continue this discussion. Is there anything that we haven't said or anything that's percolating for you based on what's been said so far? I will think about it. I'll come up with a really, really amazing answer about 15 minutes after we hang up from this call. <laughs> but I mean, this is my, you know, my wheels were already turning and now they're just churning at full speed. I have so many the conversations like this just make me more excited and more optimistic um, about what we can be, you know, as a yeah. community and collaborating together. Yeah. So like some tips and tricks of just ask for what you need. Yeah. Just ask other people what you think they need about, um, and and learning learning about your own value that's not that's not money and how to leverage that into um, an exchange or a partnership. Yeah, yeah, those are really cool things that I'm synthesizing based on what y'all shared that I feel so so passionate about. Yeah, I love the synthesis. I think for me to this idea that so I kind of like as a words person, I kind of hate numbers and. Um, I hate the idea of people being defined by numbers, whether that be money, weight, test scores, boo, no. Like we are so much more <laughs> than, than numbers. We are we are so much, like a number does not define you, cannot tell you anything about who you are. That's what words are for, just kidding. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to add, um, this is just an idea, an idea that, um, that I had been thinking about accessibility and bringing other people into the theater space um, is the intersection of other forms of performance art. Um, that is something that I'm really excited about. Um, one of the other um, little hustle, not hustle, side gigs that I do is I work as a um, as a princess for kids parties. So I work as Princess Tiana and I love it. It's so much fun, I love kids. Um, it's, it's a great job. And I see this intersection of performers and musicians together um, in this space. And that's a way that we can bring in other audiences. Um, so people who might come to this musician's concert um, might want to come to our show. So combining these forms, I know for me, I um, really love celebrating queer art and um, and performance art. So I love drag. I um, I love going to local shows and supporting. Um, I would love to see more intersection between, um, because we have such a rich community in Raleigh. Um, I would love to see more intersection between between our communities. I would love to, to bridge that together um, so we can have more people in both spaces. Yeah. Just more performance. We don't have to like. Yes. Yeah, I love all performance art. I'm like, where are the mimes? Bring out the mimes. <laughs> all the performance, <laughs> all the storytelling modes. Yes. Yeah. That Me. is a wish. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. Well, um, if you have been here in our Zoom audience, we would love to invite you now to to join the panel and just turn your video on, turn your mic on. And we're going to at first hold the space for you to like whatever you've been holding that you want to respond or share based on what we've already said. Um, the floor is yours. And we just ask that when you first speak, if you will um, say say your own name, maybe give a little introduction to yourself, um, a visual description, anything like that, that will help our audience know that new folks are in the room and speaking.
Don't be too shy. No. <laughs> it's it's true. It's yay. And I'm like it I mean it. You're invited. We want to hear from you. <laughs> we promise. Hi, I'm Kelly Taylor. My Hi. pronouns are she, her. I have been involved in the arts in the Raleigh community for a really, 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 really long time. Um and I um contract development director by day so i get where everyone is coming from and a lot of times for me it is about money it is about i wanted there are five shows right now that i would turn cartwheels to see and i can't see any of them which makes me sad i've got new friends in some and so forth and so on and what i think a lot of people are worrying about right now and I know I can speak very clearly for arts fields, for SA and DV fields, and the LGBTQ community is we don't know what the election is going to hold. Yeah. Trickling ends of funds, people are holding on to their money until they see what happens. That and, is astute. Yeah. Yes, and I, I do know a lot of people in the LGBTQ community will just stop giving and just give to their political candidates. I understand it's very important. So is theater, so is music, so are the mimes. Where are the mimes? I want to know that too. <laughs> yeah, where are the <laughs> Hashtag where are the mimes? Um, Okay, so this is like, this is great, Kelly. This is a radical question I want to ask in terms of the spirit of just asking, in terms of the spirit of pricing tiers and pricing spectrums. Have you or has anybody just asked, just like called up or emailed a theater and said, I can't afford to buy a ticket. Will you just give me one? I really want to see the show. No, I haven't. I can. I wonder if we all just did that. Like, what if we normalized that? I can't afford a ticket. Can I come see the show? I'll call Abby tomorrow. <laughs> That's what it boils down to. Abby, yeah, do people well, do mean, that? So I have not had that exact question. Um, but I mean, there are ways to see to see shows. We are, we're always looking for ushers. We're always looking for volunteers. Um, and one of the ways that we, because we're a nonprofit, we're also like, we don't have a ton of money. Like all of our money is very much allocated to specific things. One of the ways that we can show our gratitude and appreciation for people's time and talents and effort is to give tickets to shows. Um, so that's, and also always just ask, you know, we, we would love, I have sent out so many emails to people, to specific groups saying like, we're having a dress rehearsal we would love to have people in the audience for a dress rehearsal and no one will show up um so i think that's you know something that i'm learning is i need to be asking different people yeah. um but you know there are there are opportunities and yeah ask call me give me <laughs> i will make sure that fly uh distributes my email address and i'll i'll just go ahead and put it in the chat for everyone yay call abby Call Johanna. Johanna loves giving people scholarships and free things, or you tell me what you can afford. It's my favorite. <laughs> cause, cause yeah, cause I feel that way too. Like um, just using the example of dance nation that, you know, we established a certain number of $5 welcome tickets per show. We did the math of like, here's how many tickets at the general admission price we need to sell to balance our budget. Well, once it felt like we weren't going to sell enough of those $25 tickets. I didn't want the seats to be empty. And so that like, how do we do that? And how do we, I wonder, like, is there a way and not to put United Arts Council on the spot, but I see that we do have someone in the room from United Arts Council and they did just put out this brilliant new community calendar. I wonder if there's like a centralized way that we could all start normalizing free invited dress tickets and the like. 
um, sure, I'll go ahead and comment Hi. on that. <laughs> um, we're happy to share out in market whatever y'all want to share. Just send it to us, put it in the calendar. We have a bi monthly email that goes out and um, you know, we like to promote anything our artists want to promote. So really we're here as a resource for you. My one of my big goals personally is advocating for the depth and breadth of our artistic community because I don't think that it is fully recognized how large and mighty we are, particularly when we're talking countywide. Um, I will also say just from, you know, my uh, past life as a recovering theater marketing director, you know, we really figured out that dynamic pricing was the ticket to making the budget work and making it balance and making sure there was never less than 200 people in an audience. And, you know, I never want an actor performing in front of an empty stage. So I would way early put out discounts to days that we knew were going to be tough sales. Like, you know, in Atlanta, Georgia, Wednesday night was a hard night to sell because folks are like at choir practice at their church or whatever else they're doing on Wednesday nights, taking their kids to soccer practice. You know, so like weeks out, like at the beginning of the season, we would make that a $15 night. And that would expire, you know, like six, eight weeks before that. And then as shows sold out, then that ticket price ebbed and flowed. So there was always an opportunity for someone to opt in at a very low and affordable price for performing arts. And, the, and as soon as people caught on that that was a regular thing we were messaging and that you had to buy early, you know, then people that were price conscious and in need of a very affordable ticket knew that they, we would serve everyone. You know, but then also like we've got, you know, a sellout show and it's closing day and there's four tickets left and you're probably going to pay more than that $15. You know, I think that was just kind of the expectation. Um, but yes, I agree in making theater accessible to everyone is is a hard, hard nut to crack because it is a very um, expensive but necessary part of our culture. Because where else do we get to like sit side by side? But yes, happy to tell your stories. So if you have stories to tell, just email them and we will get them in our e-news and we will hit our listserv and our social media and we're always looking for content. So um, so now we're here. And thanks for the shout out, Danny, on the grants. Of course. I'm so glad you said something about that. I was literally drafting an email to you right now, Jen, with like <laughs> with my posters for ex-boyfriends to be like, hey, because oh, no, perfect. We've got an we've got an email going out this week. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, I'm like, let me uh, I will uh, not uh, forget to send the email uh, today. Uh, I'm like, okay, it's on the top of my brain. <laughs> All right. I will, yeah, I will send materials to um to promote because I know for me in terms of as um, sitting on this other side, like I have to sell tickets now and I'm used to being an actor. I don't have to sell tickets. Like, and now having this fear of like, what if no one comes to the show? Uh, what if it's just empty seats? And sort of how do we, how do we fill those seats? Um, and I am really happy to say that tickets for the second stage series are all $10, which is a lot more accessible. And uh, I, so I have on my website, tickets are $10, bring your friends. Um, because it's just like, it's a way that people can come and see. Um, so that's something that I'm trying to be transparent about in my own marketing of the show is that this is something that is more accessible um, and is and is exciting. It should be a fun experience. Like You guys are doing great work. Thanks for letting me be an interloper and listen in. No, thank you. Like, that it's it's the it's all the people in the conversation that's going to make actual new things happen and just hearing you all talk like I feel like okay we need to we need to talk to some marketing directors about a campaign around reduced and free nights and we need to talk to all the different theater companies to be like hey when you want to give away tickets or give really free tickets like let's all use this marketing campaign let's all like funnel through this because that's my magic wand is what we're hitting it is like at the grind of marketing and selling tickets right now um and like the lack of of arts journalism and the mo the money that's drying up journalism and the ways media outlets and the way news is shared and received you know we can all be doing good initiatives but how do we 
how do we actually make sure people know about it? Um, because even if you're working very, very, very hard at that for very long hours for over a very period of t hard, long period of time, it's not producing results anymore is like the thing I'm noticing. Yeah, it's challenging. And that's, um, I think, kind of a cost effective, low hanging fruit in a way that United Arts Council can help support is that, you know, we don't have some of the same um restrictions that different government agencies have because we are an independent 501c3 even though most of our grant money does come through taxpayer dollars um so you know yes we can grant money um you know we're not granting six-figure grants so what are the other ways that we can help bolster up our artistic community spread the word and create revenue streams because no, we're not producers right we're not competitors our job is to make sure that everybody knows where they can go and buy a ticket to your events. Heck yeah. Yes. Um, just some more of my questions that I have some prompts and like, again, everyone's welcome to be in the, in the conversation. Um, uh, one of the things that one of our panelists who um, couldn't be here at the last minute wanted to share with everyone is some feelings around uh, design teams and production teams and thinking about ways to make those groups. Uh, how, do, how do directors and producers and designers and tech and production folks meet each other more and how do we uh, make room in our budgets and our hearts for that? <laughs> Anyone want to speak about that? Yeah. I mean, I do. <laughs> Please. Please, do it. I have a lot of opinions about about producers creating space for uh, creative teams that they're unfamiliar with. I spent 10 years of my life producing theater and there are, um, you know, there's certain directors that only want to work with familiar teams. There's certain artistic directors that only want to work with familiar teams. But I do think that when we hiring directors, particularly directors of diverse cultural backgrounds, diverse age backgrounds, diverse gender identity backgrounds, we need to create space to understand that we don't know what we don't know and have trust in the artist that we are choosing. That's, I mean, trust is hard, but I think to me that is a driving value if we are truly going to be representative on the theater stage. Yeah. What does building trust look like? In addition to giving opportunity, like try as I, you know, I've been trying to freelance direct myself a lot lately and it's really hard. No one's hiring directors. First of all, they're hiring their directors three years in advance and only hiring the same people they know it's it seems really difficult to get a company a producer a hire or an artistic director to consider new directors I think this is sort of a a similar idea to something that um was mentioned before with that I, that I thought of like creating um, more learning experiences for people who haven't already done this. Um, I know as as somebody who is creating my own thing, but also as friends who have want to direct and get into directing, it is so hard to to break in. It is so hard to get started. Um, so I'm definitely I'm definitely interested as a as a performer in in these conversations about how do we bring people new people in because um you know we don't we know what nothing lasts forever and it's really important that we bring in new people and new ideas as as things change and time shift um and create as much inclusivity as possible along the lines of just you know knowing you know who who is available for what is there a database 
that anybody has in the theater community of like, here are people that direct, here are designers. I, that, I mean, you know, every, every company does auditions. And so I know we keep, you know, a database of actors and we do have, you know, a database that we try to keep up to date, but if there, if there is a centralized way or again, you know, companies collaborating with each other um, so that we know who's available for what and who's interested in doing certain things. Um, so Joanna, like I actually was like, oh, you want to direct? I will be emailing you later for something. Um, you know, stuff like that. You know, just again, this is, you know, putting yourself out there and asking and, you know, getting feedback and communicating between the companies. I think it'd be really, if if something like that doesn't exist already, it would be a mighty task to get it going, but I think worth doing. Yeah, I know a lot of people have tried and have mm-hmm. and and have that. So if you're one of those people who has one of those databases, mm-hmm. let's figure out how we can coordinate that. Yeah. And then go pitch it to Jen <laughs> to be like, hey, United Arts Council, will you hold this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this somewhere that you something. were always looking for, like, oh, like our choreographer dropped out you know, two weeks before we were supposed to start rehearsals, who do we ask? Yeah. You know, there's, you know, because life happens. Um, and so having, you know, contacts for people, I think, to, and then more people can be given those opportunities if we know that they're looking for them. And how do we normalize saying that publicly? You know, like how yeah. do we normalize just popping that up on your social media instead of trying to solve because it's when you try to solve those problems in the background and in a bubble is how you wind up working with the same people over and over again and set oh. new people. Oh, look, Jen's got a sheet. <laughs> what? And the news that surprises no one, there's a spreadsheet. Um, I have a spreadsheet. Um, but that wasn't created by something that was shared with me during um, Black Theater United kind of this is a BIPOC, it's a, it's a director's database, but it's a national database of BIPOC. I am so glad to hear, um, hear you say that, Jen, that there's that resource. I know for me, when I was looking for a director for my piece, um, this is, my show is about my experience as a, as a Black woman. And to me, it was so important to have a, um, have a director, have directors that understand <laughs> that perspective I was like this is a story that cannot be told by a man period and so like having a resource there I was you know really lucky to have connections in the community and friends who were like what about these people um but having that resource there I think especially for people creating new works um is so Mm -hmm. so important yeah heck yeah and fly fly put in the chat that Monica from Facebook says, love the idea to have more workshops, perhaps also places to showcase that work done to get eyes on new mm-hmm. artists of all areas of theater. I agree. And um, that's actually what WTF's uh, focus is, is moving our, our move towards um, in us ha- moving to have just a festival every other year and a main stage in the opposite years. In between that, how can we foster more workshopping, more work in its early stages, <laughs> get helping folks showcase their work? And um, to that end, our for next year's festival in 2025, that what we are offering is a performance showcase. So instead of pitching to a fringe festival or to, for a stage reading, you get to pitch whatever it is you want to showcase. And we'll do our best to platform as many of those pieces as possible and get as many potential uh, producers and, and other folks there as we possibly can. So that's that's our new commitment. I mean, I don't feel like it's a new commitment. It's just we're changing the shape of the commitment. Because <laughs> I agree. Yes. I think that workshops are so awesome. As like a learning experience, I think sort of we get into this this bubble or this idea as performers sometimes that the only opportunities to do theater are shows. 
And that is just not true. That's something that I taught in my workshop is that if you want to be involved in theater in this scene, you don't only have to do it, get into it by auditions. There are so many learning opportunities and opportunities to perform at schools and opportunities to write and learn like Sips and Scripts um, is a great is a great resource yeah. uh, that's available. There are so many things in the community um, that I feel should really be uplifted. Um, and we should really get out of this binary that the only thing that is like counts as theater is a show because it's not. Theater is so much bigger than that. Yes, workshopping, it, it's iterative work. It's like mm -hmm. we're by doing one process, we're learning to apply to the next and the next. And a workshop production can be just as nourishing, if not more so. And inviting, right? Invite that mm -hmm. kind of see how we actually are, you be how you actually are together in the room energy. Okay, we solved it. Great. Yeah, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Great. <laughs> Um, is there anything else that anyone wants to say before we end our live stream portion and let the folks who are in the Zoom room just talk to each other for a few moments and like have that um, more private, what's happened here, stays here, what's learned here, leaves here type of combo? Okay, then my last question to our panelists and anyone in the Zoom who wants to say, what have you experienced recently in Raleigh that has had an effect on you in the theater? Oh. I, can, I can go first. Do I it, think do it. Please do, because I need time to think I of need to think. I know, we see a lot of things. It's like, oh my gosh, it's a lot to think of. For me, um, one of the greatest theater experiences that I've had um, and had recently that really changed my thinking and views about theater and about performance art um, was Equus at Interact. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Aaron was um, was on, and I was you know I'm just we love you, Aaron. We'll see you next yeah, in the next we'll season. <laughs> Um, but that show for me, I um, I had heard of it, but I hadn't seen it. But seeing it, um, seeing it done, and I just think those ideas and um, I'm so interested in stories about mental health um, and I'm really interested um, with my art in sort of taking away some of the stigma and shame that comes from struggling with mental health. Um, and so to see a story like that put on with so much vulnerability um, from all of the performers and so much so much creativity and wonderful brilliant storytelling I was so moved and um, it made me so excited about um, about what we're doing and what we're creating I was like I I am in the right place <laughs> when I was in that room I was like I am exactly where I need to be awesome I love that. yes um, for me, I guess from a performance standpoint, I did a show with Seed Art Share recently. There's just a, you know, murder mystery, dessert theater. Um, but it's the first time in a long time that I've gotten to do theater outside of a theater space. Um, so we performed in a, in a house in downtown Raleigh and it just, it reignited my love for immersive theater. Um, and got me really excited about other, you know, non-traditional ways that we can do theater in the area. And um, yeah, so seeing the possibilities is, has been something that I've really been focusing on for the past few months because of that experience and looking for, for more ways to, to bring theater outside the theater building. Yes, Seed Art Chair is amazing at that. Mm -hmm. Creating these like nutritious, lovely experiences for everyone that like are not bound to a building. Shout out to Seed. Shout out to North Valley <laughs> Arts and Creative Theater. And everyone go see Ex-Boyfriends in June by Danny Cohen. Yay. It's uh, our $10. Bring your friends. It's only $10. <laughs> Bring your friends. And our big advice of the night is to ask for something. Just 
ask for it and report back to us and let us know how it went. If by asking for the thing you want or need, did you get it? We want to know. And we want you to come talk about it on future WTF town halls. Quick plug, we're going to be doing this every Monday night in April and May. We'll have different guests, different panelists, different friends, um, and different conversations. Next week, our topic is, is theater bleeding? And then we put into scary parentheses to death. Um, because some of us are really scared about mm -hmm. what's ha what's happening um, to the industry and the world of theater that we know and love. Um, so let's talk about it. And, you know, as the weeks go forward, the topics uh, move into Danny and I's favorite thing of generative uh, ideas. So after mm -hmm. that, we're going to talk about the possibilities of sustainability in theater. And then in May, we're going to get into like, in how we get inspired about things, how we how we manifest what it is that we're looking for, and we're gonna go into the summer feeling feeling super sparkly, hopefully again about the theater and our place in it. Um, and we have a series of spring workshops. Um, they're all available at sliding fees. Most a lot of these workshops are um, for per playwrights, directors, producers, and one that we're particularly excited about is for anyone. It's called Ready, Set, Submit Yourself, and it's going to be a two-day intensive where uh, me and you are going to work on your resumes, your artist statements, all your materials, and work on all the goals that you've been looking at. Uh, forward to submitting yourself for, uh, but just haven't gotten it together just yet to do it. So we'll be ready, set, submitting. I want to plug that one especially. Okay, we're going to end the live stream portion of the meeting, but those of you who are in the Zoom, don't leave. We're still, we're still having our time together.